everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for Bible study here at the New Beginning Church, where our pastor is Pastor Matthew Alexander Davis. Our scripture tonight will come from John 15, verse number 13. John 15, verse number 13. And I'm going to read from the Holman CSB Bible. And it says, No one has greater love than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. In the reading, the, the name of this, uh, title of this reading is The World's Best Friend. And it says, Who's the best friend this world has ever had? And the answer is Jesus, of course. When you invite him into your heart, Jesus will be your friend, and he will be your friend forever. Jesus has offered to share the gifts of everlasting life and everlasting love with the world and with you. If you make mistakes, he'll still be your friend. If you behave badly, he'll still love you. If you feel sorry or sad, he will help you feel better about this world and about yourself. Jesus wants you to have a happy, meaningful life. He wants you to be generous and kind, and he wants you to follow him. The rest, of course, is up to you. You can do it. And with a friend like Jesus, you most certainly will. When we are in a situation where Jesus is all we have, we soon discover that he is all we really need. Jesus is the light of the world, and God wants him to be the light of your life. Our song for today is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. you are the great king, you are the great God. We thank you for blessing us so tonight to come to hear your word. We pray that you bless us as we study your word, bless us as we walk in your word, and bless us as we deliver your word to others. Lord, we ask you to speak to us tonight by way of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Amen. Amen. We have a friend in Jesus. If you have no friend in anybody else, amen? amen. We have a friend in Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lamb. We thank God for who he is, what he has done to them. In our book, Sharing the Gospel, 
We are on page number 43. Page 43, man. Experiencing God. Experiencing God. Who has been a sharing the gospel type of way? This whole week and weekend has been sharing the gospel. I did the sharing the gospel conference this weekend. Ah, so we are experiencing God on Instagram, sharing the gospel on Saturday. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah to the Lamb. God is such an awesome and He's such a great God. Amen. Good to see everybody gathered tonight. We're on page number 43. We will begin where it says, Hearing God's voice. Hearing God's voice, and we will look to stop after number four on page 44. Amen. Amen. So, one sister Davis, sister Carolyn Davis, read number four, and that's where we will intend to stop unless the Lord walks through here and like a rushing mighty wind. Amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb. God is such an awesome and such a great God. How many of you would love to hear God's voice? Anybody? Would you just love to hear God speak directly to you? Yes? No? Yes. You all sound like the Israelites. The Israelites, the Lord speak to us, and when he got through speaking, they didn't want him to speak anymore. <laughs> Y'all have that, that same attitude on tonight, like, well, if I ask God to speak and he starts speaking, is he going to speak like he spoke to them? You remember when the Israelites said, God, we don't want to hear Moses anymore. We don't want to hear from this 80-year-old man, God, you speak to us. All by yourself. We are here from you, God. And when God got through tearing up the place, <laughs> making a rumble, making noises, they said, no, God, we're here, Moses, now. We're here, Moses. I just want to warn you, if you don't want to hear me tonight, let God start speaking. Hallelujah. When God speaks, he's worse or better than he has been. How many of you remember that statement? When you have heard him speak, people listen. What was he as under? Insurance guy? He was what? Stock broker. Does he still have your money? He said, when he have heard him speak, people listen. That he will make a difference in your money and in your life. I come to tell you the night when God speaks, he makes a difference. For the better, he won't even take your money and run with it. Because it means nothing to him. So we want to hear the voice of God. We really want to hear what God has to say, yes? yes. We want God to speak to our, our hearts, speak to our mind, speak to our intelligence. We want to hear God speak. Page 42, 43, rather, it says, hearing God's voice. I think, did you bring the mic? I think Sister Davis Davis will, will start us off hearing God's voice. When you when you get the mic, make sure you read the scripture first and then read your paragraph. And since you read scripture, you need to stand and read that scripture. Amen. Hallelujah. The scripture is Romans 3, verses 10 through 11. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 11. We want to talk about hearing God's voice. Okay. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. Romans 3, 10, 11. Sin has so affected us that we cannot understand God's truth unless the Holy Spirit reveals it. He is the teacher. When he teaches you the word of God, listen carefully to him and respond to him. As we pray, watch to see how he uses scripture to confirm God's word in your heart. Watch what he is doing around you and in your circumstances. The God who is speaking to you as you pray and God who is speaking to you in scripture is the God who is always working around you. Amen. Let's stop right there for a moment. Sin has affected us. 
sin has affected us in such a way that we can't even hear from God. When Adam and Eve was walking earth, they had communion with God. They had communion with God. They walked with God. They talked with God. The Bible talks about how God spoke to Adam in the cool of the day. They had great kononia. What's kononia? What's kononia? They had kononia. They had intimacy with one to with one to another. Yes, they had intimacy. God gave instructions. Adam listened. How many of us wish that we could give instructions and somebody would listen? <laughs> just somebody. I mean, somebody. if we would just give instructions and somebody would listen. What if we gave instructions and our children would listen? The world would be a better place to live. It would have been so much easier of a life for me if I had just listened. If I had listened and heard. I know you hear that, but I guess. If I had just carried out the instructions just the way they would give it to me. One day they were bringing the Heart of the Covenant, covenant back and the wagon kind of took a dip on one side. And God said, don't touch the ark. I think it's Uzzah, Uzzah, reached up and tried to be helpful and touched the ark. Tried to hold it up. And he died. I think God was pretty serious about that. <laughs> and when we look at it today, we said it was not fair. He was trying to help. He was trying to sing in the choir. He was trying to usher. He was trying to greet the people. He was trying to watch the parking lot. He was just doing what church folk ought to do. But God said, don't touch it. And guess what he did? He touched it. You know where that initiative came from? God said, don't eat to Adam and Eve. And guess what they did? They ate. And because of Adam and Eve's sin, now we have been impacted and affected by sin, so much so unto all of us have sinned. Unto all of us are guilty. Not y'all, but all are guilty of sin. And sometimes we mean well. I mean, every time we want to do good, he is present with us. Paul says there's a war going on within us. There's a war going on outside of us in Ephesians chapter 3. But there's a war going on in internally, inside of us. There's a war. There's a struggle. Somebody's struggling here tonight. There's a war going on. I mean, there's some turbulence in us. It's a, there's a war going on, and it's between good and evil, between the devil and God. How many of you saved folk have this struggle? Every now and then, you just want to give them a piece of food. <laughs> Every now and then, you just want to use a four-letter word and then a 13-letter word. <laughs> Every now and then, you just want to tell them where to get off. And every now and then you want to lay hands and not pray. There's a war. There's a war going on. It's, it's turbulence in us. And you know what happens when there's turbulence on the plane? People get hurt. People are walking around and all of a sudden, poof, there's a drop. All of a sudden the door flies off. There's turbulence. It is that way with the Christian something going on in all of us. God said do, the devil says don't. God says don't, the devil says do. Man had a dog, had a black dog and a white dog. Man came over one day and asked him, which one of these dogs? These dogs are the same size, just about. Which dog win when they get to fight? The man said, the one I feed the most. I'm telling you, the war that's going on in you, 
It is the ones you feed the most that's going to always win. When you feed him the word of God, he will win. It's a spiritual war going on in us. Sin has so affected us that we cannot understand the truth of God. We don't even know how to grasp it. Jesus says in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus that you can't even see the kingdom. You can't understand the kingdom. You can't realize the value of the kingdom unless you are born again. You've got to be saved. And then after you say that, there's a war going on in us. A struggle. That's that war. And we can't even understand the truths of God. We can't understand God's truth. We can't understand the word of God. We can't even hear from God unless the Holy Spirit moves and reveals it to us. We have to stay close to God and have an intimate relationship with him. Come and kneel with him. We got to stay close to him. Walking with him in his word daily so we can even understand what God is trying to do in our lives. Unless the Holy Spirit reveals us, we can't. Because the Holy Spirit is our teacher. And the Holy Spirit, when he teaches the word of God, Listen carefully, the author says. When the Holy Spirit is teaching, we ought not be speaking. When the Holy Spirit is teaching, we ought not be walking. When the Holy Spirit is ministering, we should not be moving. We ought not get distracted. That's why it's so important on Sunday morning. When the preacher stands to take his text, we ought to not be moving and doing stuff, playing with the baby. Eating our meal that we couldn't get finished with on the streets. <laughs> playing with our phone, looking at a new toy. Googling with the baby. <laughs> the baby's already enough distraction. He doesn't need an adult to get with them. When the Holy Spirit is speaking through the word of God, we ought to be attentive to him. The Holy Spirit, him. The Holy Spirit, he. We ought to be attentive to him. Yes? When the invitation is extended, the door of the church is open. The door is open. The door stands ajar. The door of the church is open. There is an invitation. Someone is wrestling on the inside with whether to come down the aisle. We ought not be distracted. That's not the time to talk to your neighbor. I know a lot of preachers will say, look at your neighbor, talk to your neighbor. That's not the time to talk to your neighbor. <laughs> That's not the time to give somebody a high five. Any little movement will break the consecration. We have to make sure that we, when we come to worship, we worship. When the Holy Spirit is teaching, the Holy Spirit is speaking, you ought to be ready to hear. Speak, God, speak. Speak, God, your servant listens. You can't be thinking about the roast that you got in the crock pot at home. God is trying to speak to you. You can't think about, well, what, what are we going to have for dessert? I got the greens, I got the black eyed peas, I have the cornbread. Now, what are we going to have for dessert? I didn't go by there and pick up no soda water. It's important for us to listen when the Holy Spirit is speaking. We ought to listen carefully to him, not it, to him and respond to him. Amen. We ought to respond to him. Whenever I write a letter, I always, whenever I write a letter and I'm asking someone to do something, I always close it out by saying, I am looking forward this week to hear a positive response from you. What did I just say? What am I saying? I don't want to hear right away. I don't want you to wait. 
I want, I want to hear a positive response. Meaning, whatever I've asked you to do in this last two paragraphs, you know, because the first paragraph is the introduction. I, hello, I'm Matthew Davis. I am the pastor of New Beginning Church. I'm calling and uh, writing for this purpose. Two, three lines. Next paragraph. This is what I'm asking for. Tell them what you want, repeat what you want, and tell them you're looking forward to it. We learned that in fifth grade, right? You, you tell them what you don't tell them. You tell them, and then you repeat what you told them. Introduction, write, and conclusion. And that can be all in one paragraph, or it can be in three different paragraphs. But whatever I do, I'm going to close it by telling them, I'm looking forward to hearing a positive response from you by August the 28th. 2024, as if he doesn't know what day of the week it is, as if he doesn't know what time of year it is, I look forward to a positive response. The Holy Spirit is looking forward to a positive response from us. As he teaches us, as he, he does things in our lives, and you will find out later in this lesson, he's doing things in circumstances. And he's looking for us to respond authoritatively. As you pray, watch to see how he, the Holy Spirit, is speaking. And he, the Holy Spirit, God, is uses the scripture to confirm God's word. God will always confirm his word with his word. And his word never contradicts itself. When you don't look at the scripture in content and in context, you're in trouble. One guy, one guy had stole something, and he went to the word, and he said, well, the Bible opens up that, that's what I'm going to do. He stole something, he, he, he's sad, and he wants to make sure that he gets it right with God. He thought the Bible was going to tell him, return it back to the man that you borrowed it from or you stole it from. But when he, he opened the Bible, the Bible said, and Judas went out and hung himself. <laughs> His forgiveness was shocked. No, I'm going to close that up and hold it up again. I want him to say, I'm going to be blessed in the country. I'm going to be blessed in the city. It says, and Judas went out and hung himself. We have to make sure that we read the word in content and in context. Y'all know what my next question is. What's the difference in content and context? I see all six, eight, ten, twelve of your hands going up. Come on, tell me. What, what is the difference between content and context? Let me give you a clue before you tell me. When you open your book to the first part of your, any book that you're reading, when you open a book to the first part, you have a table of content. content. What does that tell us? Everything has to kind of cover. It tells us what we're going to cover, but what does it say? This is what you will find in this book. This is what I'm going to cover. It is the table of content, right? So it's dealing with what is in. The context is what is around you. The context is what's going on, what is outside of the book, the circumstances. How can we identify the United States of America when we talk about the culture right now? What state is the United States of America in right now? Who said so? I said crisis. Who said crisis? Crisis? Terrible? Right? That's the context. That is the, that is the, that is the context in which we live in. We live in a terrible, uh, in your words, a terrible context. Why is this terrible? Why do we deem it terrible? Because of what's going on. Yeah. Oh, we're no, divided. Yeah. No, we're divided. We're divided. That's what I'm looking for. So we, we're we practically split right down the middle. Yeah. I mean, flat down the middle. I think one million people separated the last vote. And I'm still trying to figure out how that happened. 
That means we got some undercover cover brothers and undercover sisters. We got some undercover and undercover brothers and sisters. Trump says it's going to be a bloodbath if he doesn't. You're going to see them all come out. Lord, how much? We in a terrible context right now. We're in a bad situation. This is, it can't get any worse than a civil war right now. We're in a bad situation right now. And so we have to make sure when we read the word, we read it in the right content, in the right context. We got to be clear. We have to understand clear. And the only way we can understand clearly, number one, is through the Holy Spirit. As you pray, number two, through prayer. He says, as you pray, watch to see how God uses scripture to confirm God's word in your heart. God uses scripture to confirm scripture. God uses situation. Let's look, let's look for it. Watch to see what he is doing around you in your context. Pastor Corey Gardner says, if you do not study the word, in his content and in his context, you end up conning the text. <laughs> if you don't study the word with great resources and make sure you stay on task, you end up conning the text. I say you end up lying on God. Because if God didn't say it and God didn't mean it that way, you're lying on God. Let's, let's look right quick at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I want somebody to read from the King James Version. 1 Thessalonians, in the back of the Bible, is in the New Testament. We're looking at Greek literature, right? Because it's New Testament, we're looking at Greek literature. In the Old Testament, we're looking at Hebrew literature, right? So when we look at that, that particular passage, that's 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 15 is where we are. When we look at that text, I want to make sure that the preacher that preaches to me is not conning the text, is not lying on God. Someone read that in the King James Version for me. 3 and 14, I mean 4 and 14. 4 and 15. 4 and 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Okay. Key word is prevent. King James uses this word prevent. He's talking about the resurrection. He's talking about when God sends Jesus Christ, he's going to crack the sky. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that the, at the voice of the archangel, at the trump of God, Jesus Christ will crack the sky and the dead in Christ shall rise first and those of us who remain will be caught up with them in midair. In the midst of that passage in the pericope, he says we shall not prevent those who are dead in Christ. What does the word prevent mean? In, in the 21st century and in the 20th century, the word prevent means to hinder, to hold back, to stop. Yes? So when he says we should not prevent them, it has been taught and it has been preached that we will not hold them back. We can't even get our own selves together. So we know that's not what it's saying, right? So who has a different version? other than King James. So we, we generally read from the New King James. Who has a different version? Brother Miles. That's, that's the mic down, down to that young man right there. Please. 
So the key word here is prevent. Read verse, verses, verse number 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15, please. In a particular version? Any particular verse. I know you're tall, but we still want you to stay. <laughs> We can tell, we can still tell you sitting. So this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. What version is that? Uh, this will be New King James. Okay, New King James. <laughs> New King James. We, we're looking at the word prevent, and we are proving tonight that if we don't do our work study, then we end up conning the text. We end up lying on God. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. You didn't read the word prevent? Oh, precede. Okay, so what that tells us is when we do our word study and we look at the word prevent and what the author is really saying in the first century, he's really saying we will not proceed or we will not go before those who are dead in Christ. You see how we have been conning the text? You see how we've been lying on God? We, you see how we've been extra biblical? What's the word extra biblical? Extra biblical, what does that word mean? Extra biblical. Now these are text questions I'm giving y'all the answers to the test now. You better write these things down, Sister Barney, because you're going to be flunking the test if you don't get these right on the test. <laughs> question. Your hand up, Brother Miles? No, sir. Okay, so what what is the word what is the word prevent? We know that the word prevent really means proceed or go before, right? So, if I say that you are extra biblical, what am I saying? I'm saying that you either add into the text or you take it away from the text. Either of the two is a bad thing. You should not add not one jot or tittle to the word of God. But in order for you to not do that, you got to do your word study. Some preachers say, man, I, I got my Bible, that's all I need. But if you don't know what the author intended, you will end up conning the text. And we found out tonight, many of you already knew, that Jesus, I mean, that Paul is saying that we should not perceive those who are dead in Christ. And he even confirms it by saying, we should not go before them. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And those of us who remain will be caught up with him in mid-air. Woo, that's good news. So we need to make sure we study the word and, and use the word to conform from the word. Watch what he is doing with you, around you, and in your circumstances. This is another way that God speaks to us. We have to be aware of what God is doing in us, through us, and around us. We got to be sure that we do. we're watchful. Watch what God is doing. Watch what the Holy Spirit is doing around us in our circumstances. It means that when a couple gets married, they stand in their wedding and stand in their reception and they say, God has sent me a good woman. God has sent me the man that God has been saving for me. And six months into the marriage, they wake up and say, God told me last night you, I chose the wrong person. <laughs> God doesn't make mistakes, right? That's why God gives us choice. We get to choose. Next question. Homework Sam. Does God prepare a man just for you and a woman just for you? Question of comments. Has God prepared one person just for you? 
And you've been waiting for years just for that guy to show up, riding on a white horse, stallion, Mr. Tall, Dark, and Handsome. Or did you paint a picture in your mind of what you, you want? Do you get to choose? How many of you chose whether or not you come to church tonight? Anybody? Did you wait to see what God's going to say? How many of us know what we ought to be? Know what we ought to be doing? Even know what we ought to be saying? In our circumstances, God is speaking. The God who is speaking to us in prayer is the same God who's speaking to us in Scripture. And he's the same God that's working around us. He's the same God. The reason why the author paints this picture is because sometimes we read the word and we, we know who God is. We can agree with him in the word. We know beyond a shadow of doubt that Abraham was going to kill Isaac. Yes? He was going to do it. And we can believe that God gave him an escape, gave him a way out, gave him a ram in the bush. We believe that, right? Well, why don't we believe that God will give us a way out? The Apostle Paul says that, that in the midst of our temptation, God will give us a way out. And if we go on and see, and guess what happened? We chose to. Have you ever prayed, Lord, I'm getting ready to go sin? God forgive me. <laughs> Anybody? How many people have done it and don't want to admit they did? God, I'm, all, I'm premeditating. I'm getting ready to go sin, Lord. I know you said don't do it, but Lord, I'm going to sin and I ask you to forgive me for it. Does that prayer really get through? God is giving you a way out. That flat that you had on your way to sin, God was calling your attention to it. Turn around. Go back home. Read the Bible. The last time you went out, on watch night when you should have been at church, what happened? Mm. Mm -hmm. That pastor know that people don't do watch night anymore. And besides, we're not watching the new year out anymore anyway. We meet at 8 o'clock and out by 9.30. That, well, I'm giving you a chance to do what God has called you to do or do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> God is speaking in our circumstances. God is speaking all around us. God is speaking to us in prayer, and God is speaking to us in his word. The danger is when we make God's word say what we want it to say. Have anybody been guilty that you know, not you, but anybody been guilty that you know, that makes the word say what they want it to say? They are just caught in the text. Okay, so the name is Davis, you got number three, right? Number three, these are, these are questions concerning what we just read okay. in Romans chapter three. When Jesus returned, oh. when Jesus returned to heaven, which persons of the Trinity was sent to speak to God, the Holy Spirit? To God's people. God's people, I'm sorry. The Holy Spirit. Right? So when Jesus left planet Earth and went back to heaven, he said the Holy Spirit is going to come and he's going to teach you all things. He's going to teach you in agreement to what I've already taught you. Next question. What are four ways the Holy Spirit speaks? What are the four ways the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, speak? What are the four ways? What's number one? The Bible. The Bible through his word. Number two. Prayer. 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 He is speaking as we pray. God, speak to me. God, speak to me. What is the next one? Circumstances. Circumstances. The stuff we go through. God has not shut us off. He is still speaking. 
Our circumstances, what are the next? What is the next one? Church. The church. So he confirmed we ought to go to church. We ought to be in church. We ought to stay in church. So it's why we ought to go to church. And it's just something that the pastor just makes up. Y'all ought to come to church. Because I know people think that we making it up. Why should we go to church? Pastor. Why should we why should we go? What are some of the reasons we should go to church? Why, why go to church? To fellowship with other brothers and sisters and to hear the word. Okay, to fellowship, to to spend time. Gangsters get together for fellowship. <laughs> why shouldn't Christians get together for fellowship? Dope dealers get together to, to, to swap their dope. They get together with dope buyers. Why don't the saints get together on a regular basis? Prostitutes get together to prostitute. They may not want you on their corner, but they got a friend on the corner. Why can't the church understand that there's strength, there's power in us coming together? Fellowship. Now, some folk come to church only for fellowship. <laughs> I mean, some people come to church just to have fun and fellowship. Some people will get up early in the morning to go fellowship, but they won't get up early in the morning to come to church. Oh, Lord. Nah, 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 nah. Nah, say ox right there. Say it, say it loud. <laughs> so, we have to understand that God speaks to us through church. We must go to church because we are the church. Who has this in the next paragraph? Who has the next paragraph? God speaks by way of the Holy Spirit. Who has the next paragraph? Okay, I'm about God speaks by way of the Holy Spirit. There's no verse in there. Okay, you got it all right. Okay. John chapter 10, verses 2 through 4 and verse 14. John chapter 10, verses 2, 3, 4, and 14. John chapter 10, verses 2, 3, 4, and 14. John chapter 10. But he that entered in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter opened, <clears throat> and the sheep heard his voice, and he called his own sheep by name and led them out. And when he put forth his sheep, own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep followed him, for they know his voice. Verse 14. 14. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and I'm known of mine. Okay. God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself, his purpose, and his way. Later he will study, we will study the way God speaks. I cannot give you a formula, however, and say that this is how you can know for certain when God is speaking to you. I will share with you what the Bible says. The scripture can encourage you at this point. When God chose to speak to people in the Bible, they knew it was God, and they knew what God was saying. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The sheep hear his voice. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Amen. Look at what, look at what the author says. He really he reiterates the ways 
now which the Holy Spirit speaks to us. That gives us C. C. When he, when he, the Holy Spirit, speaks, what does he reveal? He reveals himself, he reveals his purpose, and he reveals his ways. The Holy Spirit speaks by way of the Bible, by prayer, by circumstances, by the church, in order to reveal himself, in order to reveal his purpose, in order to reveal his ways. God wants us to know his ways. We, God, want us to be able to tell people that's not how God operates. God wants us to be able to tell people this is how God operates. When we are able to tell people how God operates, then we know God's purpose, we know God's ways. In circumstances, many times when people are going through, it's not the right time to tell them. But you need to be an influence to let them be reminded of God's purpose. All of us are here for God's purpose. We are here to give God the glory. Give God the glory. And we are here to understand God's ways. God, teach me your ways. The psalmist say, Lord, teach me your ways. The psalmist says, search the, the scripture in those scriptures, in those four verses, there is life. Search the scripture. Regardless of how many times we read through the Bible, regardless of how many times we listen to the Bible, God speaks over and over again, and many times he's revealing to us his different ways. God is amazing. God ought to set us at awe. People are starstruck with individuals. We need to be at awe about God. I watched this little girl, grown lady, at the game, and LeBron James came and sit next to her. And she just lost it. <gasps> I mean, flat held the breath almost till she passed out. She was starstruck that LeBron James sat next to her. How much more should we be at awe? of the presence of God. We should be blown away at God's presence. We should be in awe. We, we should be amazed with who God is as he deals with our circumstances. He says, the shepherd comes in through the door. And when the shepherd comes in, the sheep knows he's the shepherd. See, the shepherd is not like me. When I'm, when I'm here, I'm the under-shepherd, under-Jesus Christ, yes? So when people come in the door, many times, I'm either sweeping, mopping, or running the sound system. Somebody asks me, where's the pastor? And I just look at him. And after some time expires, they kind of figure it out. When we were building this building, the contractor has a bald head. The project manager has a bald head. And guess what? The pastor has a bald head. So the contractor told, told the, the pastor that, was getting ready, that he was getting ready to build his church, he said, go over there and look at the New Beginning Church for a good example. And when he came over, he came to the first person that he saw with a bald head. He sat there and had a whole conversation with me, and he thought he was talking to the project manager. He had a whole conversation. He started talking about, well, what do you think the pastor, how did the pastor do this? How did the pastor do this? And I was able to answer every one of his questions. Is the pastor involved in this project or is, is he an absentee pastor doing this project? Does the pastor know how y'all doing this stuff? Does the pastor, has the pastor approved this? And I, had, I was able to say, yes, sir. He's out here from 7.30 a.m. to sometime 8.30 at night. 
We had a whole 20 minute conversation. And he thought he was talking to the project manager. By then, the, the contractor drives up and he and the project manager get out the truck together. <laughs> and the contractor says, man, I apologize. I didn't know I was gonna take Warren with me all day, but I, I sent you over here, but I'm glad you met the pastor. <laughs> you talking about a ball of confusion. I'm telling you, when Jesus shows up, there's no confusion. His description is like none other. When the Holy Spirit speaks, we should know him very well, know him so well when we can say, that's how God operates. Or that's not God's way. We ought to know it. Why do we know it? Because we have an intimate relationship with him. We're involved with him. We know what God is doing. We know how God operates. And yes, we will never, ever know everything there is to know about God's ways, but we ought to know from day to day how God operates in our lives. A lot of people talk to me about their dreams and how they believe their dreams come true, and they talk to me about how, how they, their foreparents that's dead and gone come to them in dreams. Well, I'm not a dreamer. <laughs> I'm not an interpreter of dreams. So the only thing I can do is listen. Just listen. I do know if you spend time talking to the dead, it's called micromancy and it's not of God. People talk to me all the time about going down to the grave site and, and, and talking to their dead parents. And, and I'm like, no, I don't do that. How many of y'all don't do that? What's wrong with y'all? I got problems. I, I, was, I was going to with the pastor to the pilot, one of my cousin's body, and that guy shot. We were down there and the pastor was saying to me, now, now you do the prayer. I said, yes, sir. So after it was over, we did the prayer, I did the committal to the ground. He said, well, your dad's out here. I said, yeah, he's out here somewhere. <laughs> I said, his body was deposited out here somewhere. And I looked to my left, and we were standing right on the hill with his, his, where his, his um, tombstone was. It was just because I was unfamiliar with it, simply because I hadn't been out there since we deposited the body. Now, my family would tell you I'm strange. But we have to understand that when Jesus shows up, when Jesus is present, he knows us. The Holy Spirit knows us. And he comes in through the door. And when he comes in, we hear his voice, we obey his voice, and we walk with him. Who has the key to knowing? John chapter 8, verse 47. John chapter 8, verse 47. Sister Bernie, I think. John chapter 8, verse 47. John chapter 8, verse 47. In the New Testament, John chapter 8, verse 47. Why don't we leave the mic home so everybody can hear you talking and breathing and sleeping out there? <laughs> John 48, I mean, John chapter 8, verse 47. John chapter 8, verse 47. <clears throat> Y'all do know why I make these assignments ahead of time. John chapter 8, verse 47. <laughs> John chapter 8, verse 47. Y'all don't do for me about the book. He goes down 47. He that is of God heareth the word, God's word, is therefore near, I mean, therefore hear 
them not, because ye are not of God. Okay. So he who hears God's word that doesn't understand God's word is not of God. Okay, and you have a paragraph there. The key to knowing God's voice is not a formula, nor is it a method you can follow. Knowing God's voice comes from an intimate love relationship with God. That is why those who do not have the relationship with John 8, 47, do not hear what God is saying. You must watch to see how God uniquely communicates with you. You will not be able to rely on other people's walk with God. You will have to depend on God alone. Your relationship with him is crucial. Amen. Your relationship with God is crucial. It is ultimately so important. It is the most important relationship you can ever have. A few weeks ago, one of y'all said, we are one. We have to become one with God. Our relationship, our intimacy with God has to be of such that we are constantly in God's presence and God is constantly in our presence. The author says, hearing the voice of God is not a formula. It's not a one, two, three step solution and you got it fixed. He talks about how it's uniquely uh, it's uniquely involved with you and you alone. How many of you have a place that you go and pray? When you're at your house, you go, I mean, you can pray anywhere in the house, you can pray in the shower, you can pray in the bed, but how many of you have a designated spot where you can go and spend time with God? And when your family members see you in that spot, they know to leave you alone. Y'all try that sometimes. Some people have prayer rooms where there's nothing in that room but a kneeling chair, or there's a chair, there's a, there's a table, there's a Bible where they go and spend time with God. An empty room. How many of you got an empty room that you never furnished yet? Anybody? How many of you got a room that's so cluttered that you... You can't get nothing in there. Don't you, don't don't wave your hand. Don't wave your hand. It's all right. You know when we get when you get a brand new house, everything in here is gonna be brand new, and you never stop until you got every corner and every crevice filled. And you can't have visitors to come over because everything is filled and packed. You go to some people's house, they invite you to stay, you look around and you say, well, I'm going to pay. <laughs> it's that way, and that's a good example. I think I can use that one. That's a good example in how we crowd God out. We fill our hearts, we fill our minds with everything else, every room in our hearts, every room in our mind is cluttered where we can't get God in there. God couldn't walk in there with an 18 wheel Because we filled, our, we filled our lives with our stuff, somebody else's stuff, somebody else's problems. We filled our lives with other people's jokes. We filled our lives with everything. We filled our time with everything where God can't even get in edgewise. So hearing from God is not a formula nor a method. You have to create an atmosphere for God. You have to have an intimate relationship and it's going to be uniquely to you. You can't depend on how other people walk with God. You have to trust God for yourself. The four spiritual laws track gets to a point where it says, I think it's law number three, that you must individually receive Jesus Christ for yourself. What that means, Brother Whitlock, is every tub must sit on his own body. You must individually receive God for yourself. God has blessed us to have unique relationships with him. Number four, Sister Davis, Sister Carolyn Davis. Number four, Sister Carolyn. 
number four. Which of the following best describes the way you will know God's voice when he speaks? Check your response. Is it A, God will give me a miraculous sign, then I will know God has spoken to me? Is it A? No. Okay, that's incorrect. B, in an intimate relationship with God, I will come to recognize his voice. Is it B? Yes, it's B. C, when I learn and follow the correct formula, I will hear God speaking. That's incorrect, because it's not a formula. D, if a verse in the Bible jumps out at me, it must be God's word for my life. That's incorrect, too. So the correct answer is B, in an intimate relationship with God, I will come to recognize his voice. Amen. Turn the organ off, please. Turn the organ off. So, B is the answer. B is the answer. And the answer is, in an intimate relationship with God, I will come to recognize His voice. In an intimate relationship, you can stay up there. In an intimate relationship with God, I will come to recognize God's voice. The only way for us to have an intimate relationship with him is that we're born again. And the only way to be born again is trust Jesus of what he has done on Calvary. He died for our sins. He was buried in a barn tomb. He rose from the dead. And he was seen by over 500 men at one time. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. If you never received him in your life, this is a good time to do that. If you would bow your head with me and invite Christ into your life. Just repeat this simple prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe that if you honestly pray this prayer, you are now born again. And when you leave planet Earth, you're on your way to heaven. Where Jesus will rejoice and you will rejoice with him. And for that reason alone, we listen to what the Holy Spirit has to say. If you've received Christ as your Savior, we'd like to hear from you. Inbox us and let us know that you received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Please come by and visit us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for Bibles for Sunday School and at 10.30 a.m. for worship service. And also continue to join us for Wednesday night Bible study at 7 15 p.m. We'll be glad to have you. We're located at 4251 Sherman Road, Houston, Texas. 4251 Shurmai, spelled S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R, S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R, Shurmai Road, Houston, Texas, 77048, USA. It is offering time. It is offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through sacrificial gifts, through tithes and offering. It's time to give to the Lord. If you want to give electronically, you can give by way of Zelle, our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your gift, you can mail it to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. 
Are there any prayer requests or praise reports? Prayer requests or praise reports. Don't forget, yes, ma'am. I, I have a prayer request. Prayer uh, request. The, the young lady's name is Lindsay. Last name is Cotton, C O T T E N. She lost her husband to a massive heart attack. And that's uh, one, of my, one of my son's friends. Prayer for Lindsay Cotton, C O T T E N. Lindsay Cotton, we're lifting her. In the midst of bereavement, we're lifting her. Any other prayer requests or praise the board? Don't forget, on September the 8th, Second Sunday, we're celebrating 20 years of pastoral service here at the New Beginning Church. 20, 20 years. I've been doing something now for 20 years. Oh, good God, my has been 20 whole years. We'll be celebrating 20 years of celebration between pastor and proof. Thank you. We thank God for a great time. Don't forget on September the 28th, 29th, September the 29th, our family and friends, they will be at 1030 a.m. September the 29th, we're celebrating with Pastor Earl Reed of Indianola and in Greenville, Mississippi. We're celebrating with the Mississippi Delta. They'll be here. So we want to make sure that we welcome them and we will be a blessing to them as they are coming to be a blessing to us. Uh, invite your friends, bring them all out so we can have a grand celebration of family and friends day. Please see Sister Cora Woods for services on that day in preparation of meals and preparation of serving our guests as they come. While we stand to our feet as we come to uh, close out this section of our ministry. Father God, we thank you, Lord, and we bless your name. We thank you, Father, for blessing us and keeping us. Lord, we thank you that you're still speaking to us. Thank you, Lord, that you're speaking to us through your word, through the Bible, through the content and the context. We thank you, Lord, that you're speaking to us through prayer. Lord, speak to us as we come to you, as we lay out our wishes before you. Lord, thank you that you're speaking to us through our circumstances. Whether good or bad, Lord, we know that you are speaking to us. Lord, we thank you, Father, that you're speaking through us through our church, our church attendance, through our church activities. Lord, we ask you to speak to us. Lord, we want to hear your voice. And as we hear your voice, we want to follow. Lord, bless us with the strength, the hope to follow. We pray for Sister Catherine. We ask you to bless her during this period of bereavement. Lift up her head. Bless her life. Bless her during this period, Father God, that you will comfort her, that she will be a living testimony of what you can do in times like these. Lord, we ask you to encourage the entire family. Bless them to know, Father God, that you never make mistakes. Bless them, Father God, to lean and depend on Jesus in the midst of it. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. You are dismissed. God bless you.